You need to see reality as naked and stark as possible. And that sets you apart from everyone else. You be, it, it's sometimes very lonely to be a very effective salesperson. You hear all the bull about marketing every day. Make your money in your sleep. My new offer is crushing it. My guru could beat up your guru. It's time to go right to the source and get the truth about marketing. With your host, the founder of CopyChief.com, Kevin Rogers. Hey, welcome back to The Truth About Marketing. It's Kevin Rogers here. Thanks for joining me. My guest today, long overdue, John Carlton, uh, not only a legend in the world of copywriting, but in my life as well. Uh, John, it's no secret, has been my top mentor uh, as a freelance copywriter and uh, just in life in general. Can't say enough about all that John has done for me as a friend. I've been, uh, it's been my honor to co-host our podcast, Psych Insights from Modern Marketers, which you can find over at pi3mm.com. Uh, it's the most uh, under-marketed great podcast there is. Uh, and that show will continue, but today I wanted to have John on Truth About Marketing to, uh, to grill him on a little bit more about his copywriting process and uh, the world of freelancing and all that good stuff. So here he is. John, thanks for being on with me today. I really appreciate it. Sure. Happy to do it, Kevin. Hope things are going well down there post-hurricane. Yeah, you know, we got lucky. There's all these theories about why this area doesn't get hit as much as others that I have to knock on wood every time it even comes up. But, you know, it's, it's one of those freaky things where you watch the weather every day and it's like, yeah, whatever, it's going to rain. And even when you hear about a tropical storm or something, you, you, you kind of blow it off until it's like right breathing down your neck. And you see, yeah. again, like how many people should have evacuated in the Carolinas that didn't and now they're floating around, you know? Nasty stuff. I experienced a tropical storm in uh, Miami Beach about 20 years ago, hanging out with Halbert. Mm. They downgraded it from a hurricane, so we didn't have to evacuate. But we uh, we were right on Ocean Boulevard, literally across the street from the beach, and the ocean coming up. And it was it was interesting. Everything blowing sideways. I walked into a bar to go have a drink because there was nothing else to do. The power was out. Mm -hmm. And I closed the door and the rain was hitting the door so hard that the leaks of drops of, of rainwater that came in through the door actually flew into the room a couple of feet before they landed. Wow. So it was yeah, it was it was pretty phenomenal. Yeah, it's intense. I don't think it, it, it's like a TV show until it's at your door or something. Right? Yeah. You know? <laughs> and you're like, wow, this is way too real. <laughs> way too real yeah. uh, so uh yeah cool man so it, you're out there you live in nevada something yeah. you don't talk about too much but uh it's interesting how you you ended up there uh because you live you know you you're a california guy you grew up in yeah. uh, uh, uh rancho cucamonga yeah we called it cucamonga back then but yeah southern southern california just about a little less than an hour outside of Los Angeles. So in that Los Angeles orbit, but in the outlying area. The town I grew up in, Cucamonga, was on. I grew up a block from Route 66 mm. with all the iconic stuff going on. You know, uh, you know, in and out hamburgers started there. McDonald's started down, down the way. Drive-in movie theaters was a standard Friday night date. It was just, you know, it was everything. And some of the more adventurous pals I had when I, who could pass for being 18 when, when they were 16 got made it down to the Whiskey A Go-Go and stuff oh, wow. when the doors were the house band and wow. things like that. So, And Frank Zappa's dad taught at my high school. Frank Zappa got his start in Cucamonga in a recording studio there just, just down the street. So it was, it was it was a very interesting interesting place to grow up. I... I, I moved to Northern California for most of my young adult life, then back to Los Angeles and lived at the beach in Hermosa and Redondo Beach for, I don't know, over a decade. And then finally just got, you know, woke up one day and realized there were 36 million people around me. I didn't know any of them. And it was, I felt crushed by the population. So I moved up to uh, the high desert in Northern Nevada, nestled here in the uh, bosom of the Sierras, just below Lake Tahoe. Mm. I, I love it up here. No, no humidity, uh, four seasons. It's great. It's a, it's a writer's paradise. A lot of excuses to stay inside and write. Mm -hmm. And when spring and summer hit, a lot of excuses to get out and do stuff. So, Yeah, that's perfect. 
And you've got the final presidential debate coming to your town, don't you? No, it's in Vegas. I oh, believe. it's in Vegas. Oh, I thought yeah. it was. Oh, okay. You know, it's funny how many people have known me for years, like even Dan Kennedy, and, and people think that Vegas is just right outside of Reno. And it's not. We're opposite sides of the state. I mean, right. I, I'm closer to San Francisco than than Los Angeles, and Vegas is right, you know, this direct shot across from L.A. So, You know, talk about politics, and I, I don't want to date the show, but you know, <laughs> we're in the certainly the most unique and tumultuous, uh, you know, uh, presidential election that I think anybody could ever recall. But, John, I'm always struck by your ability to recall history. You know a lot about politics and politics through history. Uh, just let's talk about this whole crazy notion of, of just this election. And the we were talking yeah. a little bit before the call about some of the stuff that's, you know, the talking points are not the normal. I don't think like one issue has been discussed at, at depth where I, I understand either candidate's agenda. It's, it's, it's just been toilet humor, you know, throughout the entire campaign. Yeah, it's that, what's that Chinese curse? May you live in interesting times, you know, <laughs> being the, the word interesting, having multiple meanings, both good and bad. Yeah. And we certainly live in interesting times. Um, I, I've always been a, a fan of history. Um, uh, a couple of salient points on that is that I, I was in high school during the late 60s, certainly a very tumultuous time in American politics. And I came from a working class um, union oriented family. But my, my family was all Democrats. Um, but we were also my my dad served in World War Two. He was drafted and drug over to Germany and, you know, kind of was digging foxholes in the snow in Belgium, dreaming about, you know, being back in Cucamonga. And uh, my brother served during the Cuban. He was in the Air Force in intelligence during the Cuban Missile Crisis in the early 60s. So when I came, when it came around to me, it was pretty obvious that I was going to, you know, go into the service. And it was right around Vietnam and things were happening and the whole world was in upheaval. And uh, I wound up not going in the service because the draft ended in my junior year in college. But it was a time where there were riots going on everywhere. Cities were burning mm -hmm. uh, in 68, 69, Watts, um, uh, Chicago. All, and, and there was a huge generational divide. And it was very serious. People were people were dying. They were getting yeah. shot. There was a lot of nasty stuff going on. And then, of course, when I was in college, there was the whole Nixon and Broglio uh, I think I pronounced that right. Yeah. Um, with Watergate and all of that stuff. And then, you know, I got out of college and suddenly it was Carter and the the malaise of the late 70s. It was a shock to my system because I'd grown up, you know, being one of those kids that dived under the desk, you know, to practice, you know, nuclear bomb drills and things like that. So when we get to this period in in history, I keep thinking how nothing's really changed. I mean, the language changes. If you watch uh, older debates on TV or even just speeches that uh, politicians gave, they were really speaking at a high school level and above. And of course, what we know now from persuasion uh, techniques is that you want to you want to really lower it. You want to get down to um, fifth grade level. Of course, fifth grade language skills now is less than what fifth grade language skills mm -hmm. were in the 60s and the 50s and the 40s. Right. And then the the other thing I like to I, I like to mention is that I really like old movies. I watch TCM Turner Classic movies a lot. And one of my favorite periods of time is the late 30s, where Hollywood was making movies and Hitler was on the rise, and nobody really knew what was around the corner, what was mm -hmm. going to happen. And in 39, he started World War II, invaded Poland and all of that. And But the movies right before that, that anxiety, that sense of pre-action uh, tenseness that's going on was palpable in everything that Hollywood was putting out. And, and I, I go back and I read old magazines and newspapers, too, because I like that sense. I... I, I I, I, that, that sense of how humans react to coming trouble or how they solve problems, how, how, how they just live their lives. It's always been fascinating to me. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, you know, we're in that kind of state now. And, and I think it's, it's heightened now. And I think a lot of people are very anxious and uh, the level of anxiety is extremely high. 
But for old, you know, grizzled boomers like me, this is just standard operating procedure. This mm. is the way it's always been. Mm. You know, I, I remember going to school in the third grade and asking the teachers, you know, where do I go when the nuclear bomb drops? And she says, well, you're probably going to stay up here because your parents will be, you know, annihilated. You know, wow. I, I think I knew what the word annihilated was. And she wasn't being mean. Mm. You know, this is the way people thought. It's like, it's going to happen. So wow. so the, the general anxieties of stuff really fits into marketing and advertising a lot. Because, of course, the main thing that you want when you get into people's heads is a huge level of empathy. And th I grew up as, I, I call myself an empath. I'm not even sure that's a, a, a real uh, word that, that uh, psychologists use. But... It said, you know, I even from a young age, I could understand what was going on in other people's heads and I kind of could walk in their shoes for a mile. So even as a kid, I was very fair. Mm. Uh, and and a lot of my friends were the outcasts of other groups and stuff. And I just took them in because they were they were very valuable. They were they were smart, but geeky, you know, couldn't play sports. And I, I didn't care about any of that stuff. So that that empathy thing, I didn't really understand what the word meant or what it was about until I became a professional copywriter. And I realized, wow, this is the skill. And when I started teaching without telling people I was doing, I really tried to amp up their their empathetic, em empathetic skills, their mm -hmm. ability to walk a mile in the other person's shoes. Um, and, and a lot of that comes from understanding history and just knowing how the human race has operated through previous times of high anxiety. Because really, anytime anybody, you know, when you're buying a house, a car, or even if you're buying a $300 course on something, you're, you're in a you're, you're in a state of, of anxious yeah. uh, wonderment. And and as as a good ad writer, whether, you know, whether it's for a VSL or an ad or whatever, you are taking that person by the hand and guiding them through mm. a very tumultuous process, a, yeah. a, a strange world of, I, I like to say for, for marketers, especially that, you know, you have to imagine that there's this wall and, and a door in the wall and you are standing beside the door and you're taking this person you say, let me lead you into this new world. And for you, it may be old hat, you know, everything about what's going to go on the other side of the wall, but the person you're leading in the cold lead or the, or the new buyer doesn't. And you really have to understand what the what the thought process is, both the the old eight brain process of, of emotional decision making and the new brain, the, the cerebral cortex process of processing new information and trying to make rational decisions while your amygdala is roiling mm -hmm. and seething and and, you know, just wants to eat and screw things. So, <laughs> yeah, no, I love that we ended up here because one of the great. Uh, things you, you, you've taught me that I repeat probably the quote you the most on is that when as a copywriter you've done your job of convincing somebody that you have something that can solve their biggest problem what you've done now is create an even bigger problem for them because right. now you have to guide them through the the anxious process of actually buying can you yeah. talk about that set of friction right there well, I, th I think what, what what I've tried to get people to do, like in seminars or or the readers of my newsletters or my blog or whatever, is occasionally I'll ask them to go out and try to talk a friend, somebody who trusts them, who, who say you, to try, try to get one of your friends who trusts you and likes you, mm -hmm. and try to get them to go see a movie that you recommend. Mm -hmm. And you will find that that's an incredibly hard process in most cases some you know especially if it's a movie that they would otherwise be inclined to go see yeah. there's a natural level of resistance that will come up and just because you told them to go see it they will often not do it mm, good point now they may eventually go do it and they may come back and say, well, I saw this great movie. And you said, that's the movie I wanted you to go see last month. And they say, oh well, I, I didn't remember that but yeah. and it's 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 because they can't, the, the the resistance levels are so high to being told what to do. And it's not just Americans, it's all over the world. People are very stubborn. They're very protective of their of this sense of 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 independence that they have, of of their sovereignty as as a as a, as a human being. 
And rightly so. I mean, we're especially in the new world, we're we're bombarded with advertising messages and and all kinds of information. You know, we're in the information age, but we don't we we still can't separate the misinformation and disinformation from the real information. The idea of truth has become a um, you know a a point of contention even in 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 you know electoral politics where they you know people are talking about post factual worlds where the facts don't matter it's how you feel about the facts yeah and 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 a case can be made that that's you know that's the way a lot of people operate it's not it's not so much what reality does to you that matters it's what it's how you feel reality is or should be Mm. that that matters And and of course my whole thing about about writing is once you become a salesman or writer, you can no longer look at the world <clears throat> the way you wish it was yeah. <clears throat> or believe it should be, because that's not going to not going to score anything. You need to see reality as naked and stark as possible. And that sets you apart from everyone else. You be, it, It's sometimes very lonely to be a very effective salesperson because you're seeing things that other people refuse to see. And you you know how the operation works you are essentially the man behind the curtain in 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 the wizard of oz you yeah. you know what works and to get your message across and in the wizard of oz not not to go too philosophical on it but he had a peaceful city that he was running they looked to the wizard you know and he had no real skills he had no real magic to be able to protect them but because the illusion that he could do this kind of helped and they protected themselves i guess there's a lot of things going on once exposed what happened to the city I mean, yeah. you know, I, I think Frank Baum wrote some more books about that. But, you know, what happens when the people have their have their magic taken away? And as a as a top writer or a top salesman anywhere, you you see behind the magic, you know how it's done. So mm. that doesn't mean there's no magic in life. The I think that salespeople lead better lives once you get over the shock yeah. of getting rid of your delusions and your in the nonsense that, that you've been been believing in. Uh, I actually care about people more, you know, mm-hmm. e- even those who are totally deluded and off their rockers. I I I feel more love in in my heart for both humanity and the world and all the little animals in it and everything. So there's there, there's a real salvation to, you know, stripping away the nonsense in life. And that, that's been one of the joys of being being able to go really deep into advertising and marketing. Wow. <laughs> it's not something you hear very much no, it from isn't. people. No, it isn't. And it's so many ways to go from that. But I, I just want to focus a little bit more on this idea of separating yourself, right? I think of – this is where I think there's a great alignment between journalists and, and copywriters. Aside of all the uh, functional similarities, it's this idea of kind of removing yourself from the process and only thinking about the reader. Yeah. Yeah, there's a sense of dissolving into the process. Mm. Um, when, when, it, it's, it's a zone. I, th- I think a, a lot of people understand the idea of the zone. Athletes get into a zone when they perform on a higher level. Writers get into a zone, too, when you're writing at a better level. But creating ads isn't just about writing. It's, it's a whole process. And a lot of that, you know, I have written for products that – I would never buy myself. I've written for markets in which I would never really become a customer. Mm-hmm. I've, you know, I've, I've stayed away from the unethical stuff, knock on wood. I've, you know, long ago, I refused to write for anything that I thought was squirrely and I got rid of bad clients as quickly as possible. And, um, it's kind of hard to do because you have to do some due diligence on any new client that comes in your life. And as a freelancer, they're all new clients, mm-hmm. you know, until you start having a, a client that, that you work with more closely. Mm-hmm. So you're doing the best you can. But when the process works, you do dissolve. You become a cheerleader for this for this for this thing. You be, you get to know the business more than the client knows about it himself. Because you're looking at it from the outside and you're looking at it from the inside. So you see you see all the warts and wrinkles and you see all the magic possible too. And to do that you 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 have to get into that zone where you, you're not thinking 
uh, critically about things. You're you're thinking as a consumer, the enthusiasm, and as a salesman, which is also enthusiasm, but also a very realistic, rational approach to the emotional job of persuasion. It's 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 a complex uh, bucket of stuff to, yeah. to work through. But it, you know, once you're once you're into it, you you realize what's going on. You are subservient to the idea, to the concept of persuading people to buy or, or try try this new pro, uh, product or this new course or this new skin cream or whatever it is you, you're selling. Mm-hmm. You, you, you enter into an alternative universe where you no longer exist with all your biases and prejudices and habits and routines and all of that. You are now a conduit. You are the translator of somebody else's experiences and routines and mm-hmm. all of that. Wow. Yeah, and that... It makes me think of your simple writing system, you know, the, the course that you, you finally, uh, I say, gifted the world because, you know, <laughs> it, it, there was no, here's how John does it before that. There, there were bits and pieces, and I know this because I basically was like in this underground marketing world, you know, like deadheads trading show tapes, <laughs> <laughs> trying to collect your teachings uh, for a couple of years before we met. And the first thing Stan said to me when we sat down was, hey, we got a new course. It's John's 17 point writing system. And uh, I was like, oh, what a miracle. Uh, yeah. But and I was you know, privileged to teach simple writing system. And, and the thing about it that's interesting was, I know, I, th- I think now there is kind of a, uh, a here's how you put it all together section. But in the beginning, yeah. th- there, there wasn't that. Yeah. And you always had a great reason why it wasn't. And it, it, it was that these are the 17 things you need to understand uh, so deeply that they just become a part of you. And so they're present every time you sit down to write sales copy. And I think as as much as we like formulas and templates and, and they serve us in different ways, a real copywriter at the end of the day sits down and goes on instinct. Would you agree with that? Yeah. You, you know, one of my biggest pieces, two of my biggest pieces of advice that I give to myself and I also give to other people is one, grow up. Um, mm-hmm. You know, stop stop believing in fairy tales and stuff. And and for for me, that's all about reality and things. So just grow up. A lot of problems that people have as adults could be centered on the fact that you just you, you just grow up. You know, it's like it's like changing a baby's diaper. Yeah, it's messy. It's all that stuff. Just grow up. It, it needs to be done. Go do it. And that dovetails into my second piece of advice, which is the one that really really addresses the thing you just brought up, which is figure it out. And that's why I didn't, you know, I didn't in the first, um, the first time we offered the Simple Writing System, we didn't have that put it all together thing, which is now an integral part of the system because so many people wanted it that I just gave up and put it in. It's yeah. now step 18. Okay. But, but it doesn't invalidate the, the figure it out thing. It's like, look, here it is. Here are the keys to the kingdom. And it's kind of like standing outside this castle with all these treasures inside and you have the key to you know the the moats you know the 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 the, the moats up I, I, the the bridge over the moat is up so there's still some water but here's the key to the door mm-hmm. and and the answer you you want from that is good I have the key I'll handle it from here not which is what most people do is okay I got the key but how do I get across the moat you know figure it out dude <laughs> you know yeah. either either find a way to have the bridge drop swim <laughs> you know go find a place where that's easier to cross just figure it out yeah. and a lot of things in life are about okay we've got all this stuff it's like people that we we come across when we're trying to teach people how to market or how to live better lives or anything you, you get these junkies who do nothing but read, can't mm. wait for the next book to come out. And they read and they read and they read and they read. And they never put, you know, they never put the pedal to the metal. The rubber never hits the road. Yeah. Um, it's it's like get yourself up to speed on the basics, then go out and mm. test it in the real world and figure it out as you go. The people who really succeed in world or, or in sport, in life, in love, in business are the ones that that figure it out as they go. And this is why a lot of us, you know, and I think I'm the, um, I'm not the first one to, to do it, but my whole shtick is all about, you know, I, I made most of the mistakes as a rookie copywriter that a 
rookie copywriter could make. And my only regret is that I didn't make all of the mistakes mm -hmm. because that's the only way I learned. I'd make a mistake, figure out what happened, what went wrong, how, what, what was lacking in my toolkit to be able to do it right. Then I'd go fill the toolkit, find out what I needed. You know, if I had to read something, talk to somebody, get some mentoring on something, do some more practice, whatever it is I had to do, I'd go do. Then I'd go out and try to put myself in that, a similar situation where I'd be challenged that way again. And, and I'd learn. So it wasn't like I promised to do better next time. You know, you know, dear client, I'll promise to write a better headline next time. No, I'd figure out why didn't that headline work? And wh what are some other ways it work? What's competition doing? What's what's, you know, start brainstorming on stuff, do some interviews with uh, feet in the street salesmen, some customers unhappy and happy customers, mm -hmm. you know, start start researching this stuff, figure it out and then come back and do it rather than you know, thinking that there's, you know, inspiration is going to come and take care of this. Inspiration, you know, is one of the worst things that people believe about writers, that you you have this sudden inspiration, you know, out of the blue, like a lightning bolt, and you sit yeah. down and start tapping it out. That's yeah. just not true at all. It's like you got to, you know, you, you can wake up and have an inspiration. You can, but that inspiration comes from a deep well of, of research and, and info and, and looking at things. And it all gets kind of put, you know, put together in your brain. That's why we often wake up in the middle of the night or while we're taking a walk or a shower or something, it just kind of comes to us in an aha experience, yeah. but not out of the blue. Yeah. Right. Great point. You know, can that, you talk about the info junkie. We see this all the time, right? It's just they're very happy to be in student mode. Uh, you yeah. know, big promises about the future to themselves, to people that love them and support them. A lot of growing frustration around lack of action. Can that tenacity you're talking about of grow up, figure it out that you took, that we've seen others take to just going on instinct and not settling for not knowing uh, for yourself – can, yeah. can you, can that be taught or is that just in -brain? Yeah. Well, I taught myself. I, you know, I didn't start my career until I was 33 years old. And before that, you know, I, I, I was an unhappy young man. I was having a lot of adventures, you know, so I had fun. I wouldn't change anything that I did, yeah. but the, the, you know, success eluded me success in relationships, success in, in, in any kind of business success and understanding life at that level where I could really say, I've got this down. I've mastered it because I was relying on getting jobs with places where I'd get fired eventually, always usually, you know, not till two years, but you know, I, I, you know, it was, bosses liked me until they didn't like me anymore. Cause I challenged them all the time. And, mm -hmm. you know, I didn't put up with bullshit and a lot of things happened. So there, I, I, I put it all all together in, in kind of an epiphany, but I've been reading a lot of stuff, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Napoleon Hill's Think and Grow Rich was huge for me. That was probably the biggest thing was I read that book, Think and Grow Rich, and I realized that a huge piece of success had been withheld from me, mm -hmm. not because people – were hiding it because a lot of them didn't know it themselves. And that, and that, that truth was you could actually want something, figure out a way to go get it and then put that plan into action. And that was, that was astonishing to me. It was like, first, I didn't believe I, I was allowed to want things. I didn't, uh, you know, I, I, I understood lusting after women, you know, and, and going after those immediate gratification things, <clears throat> but I didn't know I was allowed to want more from life. I didn't know that I was allowed to, uh, you know, have big dreams. Cause I grew up in a, like I say, a working class family where the cautionary uh, phrase used was don't get too big for your britches mm -hmm. because if you get too big, you'll get knocked down and it's humiliating. And, and that's a horrible thing to happen. And what I realized slowly is that, well, I can survive that with, but you know, I didn't even know what I wanted when I started getting into this, this uh, goal setting thing. But the key there was putting it into action because figuring out what you want and then figuring out a plan, whether a good plan or a bad plan, but a plan to put it in action. I'll do this and I'll do this. You know, if it's meeting Susie Q, you know, it's like, I'll get to know her brother really well. Cause I know he likes baseball. I'll take him to a baseball game through him. I'll meet Susie Q, you know, simple as that. But the key was putting it into action. A lot of people can think right up to the point where they got to, as we call it, you know, uh, open the curtains on the stage. You know, you get to play, everything's ready to go. But if you don't, if you don't part the curtains to yeah. the crowd, then it, the show doesn't go on. So right. 
that was just, that was a huge a huge thing and i think a lot of people operate out of fear and not having the basic tools to to get moving and a lot of times those basic tools are and this is why mentoring comes in so well having somebody who's been there to be your guide you know be be your coach one of the big things is getting that kick in the ass you need it's like somebody to say, no, stop, put that book down. Don't read another book until you put the stuff you've already learned into action. Yeah. Well, how do I do that? Well, figure it out. You know, And then if you have specific questions like, okay, I went to this client and the client told me this and I'm not sure what to do next. Okay, there's a couple of different tactics you can do, but at least you're out there working rather than saying, well, what if I go to a client and he's mean to me? You know, Or what if I, what if my car doesn't you know, start the day I have to go to the interview? <laughs> right. And you know, that's not, yeah, you laugh, but it's not an outrage. No, I know. I know. That we did. So, so yeah, it can be taught once you strip away, and the process is twofold: strip away all of the excuses, which is, "Hey, I'm stupid, and I I didn't have any money, and you know, it, it, I was dead broke, and I was living out of my car when I started my, my career." Mm -hmm. And it's like, if I did it, you can do it. So you strip away all those excuses, and then the second part is, you know, just that kick in the ass. Sometimes it's it's an ongoing kick that has to happen for a long time. And sometimes it's just a brief, brief little kick to the uh, rear that, 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 you know, kind of kicks them on, onto the stage, sort of. Mm -hmm. You know, and then the person once kicked on stage can turn around and run back off stage, in which case, you know, maybe the entrepreneurial world isn't for you. But if you're kicked on stage and you're out there and you look at the audience and you do the next rational thing that someone would do who wants to have a life on stage stage being the metaphor for an entrepreneurial life yeah. you know grab the mic and start talking if you blow it you blow it you know you're going to learn okay i need to have a routine you know right uh, you know or, or that joke didn't work you know you you know from stand up you you talked about testing stuff all the time you got to field test it doesn't matter how much your friends laugh at it and stuff it's will an audience get it will a will a cold audience who wants you half wants you to fail because there's a great heckler in the back of the room, you know, they want to see him or, or, or do the, you know, but just as much, they want to see a guy who can master that master the heckler, put him down, get rid of it, you know, right. uh, and deliver a show that you'll, you'll come out talking about, you know, days later. Yeah. Great. Yeah. When people say to me, Oh, I've always wanted to try stand up," I say, well, now you have to, <laughs> you, have, you, you, yeah. you have verbalized if this is the first time you said it or the hundredth you are now obligated to yourself to go do an open mic you're welcome <laughs> um, so <laughs> all right better. let's get to the uh what i call the essential question of this show john i've been waiting a long time to ask you this one directly i can't wait to hear your answer so john carlton what is the one thing you've done in all your experience with marketing that produced the most surprising results? Okay, I will tell you that when I became a guru in 2001, uh, there was a long process that led up to that. Gary, you know, I was, you know, best friends and buddies and partner with Gary Halbert all that time. And, and he was he was on the stage and I was content to be the guy behind the the throne and and work work out of the the sight of most people. And occasionally I'd start I'd speak on stage, but not very often. And I didn't really enjoy it. And he kept pushing me to become a guru to to just step out. He said, you know, go out there and, you know, not follow in his footsteps, but he, he wanted me to be his competition. He needed, mm. you know, needed somebody to like bounce up against. And, you know, we talked about various ways to do it. And finally, I did it and I got out there and I didn't really other than observing a lot of a lot of guys who were out there, you know, uh, Jay Abraham, Gary Halbert, Dan Kennedy, guys who had already put themselves out rather than observing that. Excuse me. Other than observing that, I didn't have a lot of insight into how to make it real for me. So I I put together a package. I put together a, a speech, which turned out to be so good that I used it for the next five years without changes. Wow. Um, but um, you know, I, I went out there and did stuff. But I started writing a newsletter to a, a people who bought my book, Kick Ass Copyright Secrets of a Marketing Rebel, which I wrote in a couple of weeks before my first seminar. So I had something to sell. And I added the the uh, newsletter. I had 300 people on that newsletter. And through that 300 people who bought the newsletter and the, the book, Kick Ass Copyright Secrets, I earned my first fortune, a list of 300 people. And the way the way that happened was these were often high 
high-end people in marketing anyway. These were the people who later became gurus. You know, I was like a I was like a guru farm for a while there. You know, people would learn from me and then go out and you know dominate their own niches. But the thing that flipped it for me was my early newsletter was was good. It was it was it read kind of like a chapter in in a book uh, that you'd read on marketing or on copywriting or something. But then one day in the first year, late in the first year. I, I just said, screw it. And and I had a a piece of advice to give. And I don't remember specifically what that piece of advice was. But rather than just lay out the advice cold, I told the story, the genesis of it. What happened to me that brought this piece of information into stark fo- focus for me to, as a tool to use, as, as, as something that became part, part of my toolkit? So to, in telling the story, I realized I was kind of, when I first did it, I was kind of editing it. I was trying to make myself seem not a perfectionist or someone great, but you know, someone other than I was, which is essentially a screw up. And you know, I, I'm 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 lazy. I'm theatrically dramatic sometimes about things. And you know, when I screw up, it's spectacular. <laughs> and 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 when I succeed, it's spectacular. And what happened was I realized that opening myself. Um, I think you and I have discussed this before. I I became true to myself. I stopped. I I took the curtain away. I stopped being what I thought a guru should be and became the guru that, that I was, the, the guy who's just just an everyday guy from a wor- working class family who stumbled into some great men, you know, mentorships with some, you know, some legendary people and had some success and doubled down on, on that success and started making all the mistakes and then learning and figuring out as I was going along, the warts, the mistakes, the blunders. And the stories I started telling really started out with a lot of my blunders. You know, it was all about me screwing it up and then fixing it. And this became the process that defined me as a as a teacher and a coach and and got the point across to a lot of people, a lot more people I had before. And like I say, from those 300 people who were the core uh, 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 subscribers to my newsletter, which was, I think, a grand a year or something, something like that. Mm. Um they they stuck with me. They they uh, they they got uh, a lot of consultation from me. A lot of them got coaching from me. They bought everything they could. They're still with me. They're still you know they bought the new version of the SWS that we just put out, version 2.0. And you know the, these have been my closest fans for a long time. Now since then my list has grown you know dramatically. But it's it's just that sense of both. You don't need a wide audience. You don't need the whole world to be able to be successful in business. And being myself just took away everything. I no longer had to adopt a different attitude when I wrote my newsletters. This was me writing to a, a dear friend or even to myself, just burying my soul, just laying it all out there, you know, warts and all, just you know, naked and stark and laying it out. And also letting my humor fly. Uh, having, you know, confessing the things that have been bothering me. So my newsletter for like eight years became this kind of journal, private journal mm. that, about marketing that I was writing. And I realized it connected with a lot of people. Now, the caveat to that is that it turned off a lot of people, too. Mm. And I have turned the best of those newsletters into a book that's on Amazon. What is it? Uh, the Entrepreneur's Guide to Getting Your Shit Together. Yeah. And that's and, and so I think it's 17 chapters, 17 of the best newsletters. Uh, slight, slightly ed- edited. And I get either four star rave reviews from people or one star. Who mm. is this guy and why is he babbling? You know, <laughs> and 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 that realization that, wow, you know, there's I would tell most marketers, if you're going to go out there, try to get the biggest audience you can. Don't go out there. Try to offend anybody. Mm. But, you know, don't be worried about offending other people, any anyone either. But, you know, try to get the biggest list you can. I did kind of the opposite of that. I went for the smallest core list that I could go so that I could take the leash off of myself, so that I could be the who I am, like like Gary and I talked, you know, late at night, you know, sitting talking about stuff, talking about people, gossiping, being ourselves, being the frail, fallible human beings that, that we were, who had glimpses into how success happened and sharing those secrets, both both the good side and the bad side. And I, I I don't know if that's a that's a good answer yeah. your your people will like, but that that be true to myself 
made a huge difference in my career because I was no longer hiding behind what I thought I should be or how I should present myself. Right. And instead it's, it's just, here I am. Yeah. And, 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 you know, perfectionists are going to hate me and people who want different kinds of information spoon fed to them. They're going to, they're not going to like me either. Cause I'm not going to spell it out that way. And right. I am going to tell you to go out and figure it out, but I'm going to give you the, the tools to do that. So it's, you know, it's tough love. It's a lot of that, but I was astonished, not at how much people responded to that, but, but how successful you could be by doing that. Yeah, that's, that's great. Now it's a great answer. And it, it's not something that most people will come. Uh, they will come to it. They will, but like you said, they will resist it because it feels yeah. like there's this other set of rules in place. And what if my mother-in-law happens across this or, you know, all these things that these fears that we have that aren't true. So, uh, you know, you know, uh, just, just to play on that, yeah. just one, one last thing. There was a, a guy, I, I won't say his name, but in Gary Halbert's circle, he was with us and we were trying to make him famous because he deserved to be famous. Um, he, he had a lot. Of, he was a uh, had been photographer to the stars and he, he was a great guy, a good friend. But he he resisted the things that needed to be done to become famous because he was worried about his reputation. Mm. And our response to him was always the same. What reputation? Uh, yeah. The only people that know you are your friends and the few people you've worked with. You know, you don't have a reputation until you get out there and lay it on the line. And he just couldn't fit that in his head. He kept thinking, if I do it your guy's way you know, outrageous headlines and, and, you know, you know, spurring the, uh, the, 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 the unconscious mind and using persuasion tactics. He thought that was going to ruin his reputation. And that's just stuck with me. Whenever I, I talk to people who are worried about things, what their mother's going to think if they see it, you know what, your mother wants to see you succeed. Your, your, your grandmother wants you to be happy. And, uh, you know, and, and, we, we we separate success from happiness too much. And I think that's that's a real key is to try to, you know, we, we all heard the stories. I can tell you from personal experience that people I've known, the richer they get, the less happy they become in most cases, in the great majority of cases. And it's because they, they don't know how to be happy. They learn how to make money and they forget how to be happy. And I know a lot of happy people who are broke. I know more people who are broke and unhappy. That seems to be the, the case in most of the world. But that, you know, that, th there's a balance in there. And a lot, some of us figured out how to do it. And that's those are the people you should listen to, really. There's a balance in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it. We could do a whole nother episode on balance, something that you've helped me with a lot. And, you know, Last thing I maybe we'll comment on real quick is you've always said to me, if you're not having fun, why do it, right? And yeah. that doesn't mean that everything's going to be fun all the time. You're running a business. There's going to be parts of it. No one's, you're probably not going to fall in love with bookkeeping, but <laughs> the big decisions you're making about what kind of people you work with, what kind of jobs you take on, what kind of people you, you go out of your way to associate with or not associate with should all be determined by the level of fun you're having when you do it. Yeah. Plus, getting good in business can help you go do the fun things you want on the side without worrying about meeting the mortgage payment. Yeah. You know, I, I spent two and a half years playing in rock and roll bands and writing bad novels living off the royalties of the ads that I'd written, you know, in the previous years. And, you know, I'd kind of stay in touch with my clients. And when I decided I didn't want to be a rock and roll star because there was no money in it, and I didn't want to write novels because I could make more if writing one ad in royalties than I'd make in 10 years writing novels. You know, when I came back, it was the business welcomed me with open arms. And it was, you know, it was, it was the advice that, uh, you know, your grandma gave you of ha have a marketable skill to fall back on, then go try to be an artist. That's really good advice. Yeah. And I think, you know, the the one thing that, you know, you and I have talked about this and, and uh, Garf and Deutsch and, and all of us, you know, we're often we're writers first and marketers second because we bring a love of writing or a love of that creative process. Of, of writing to the game first. Most writers don't make a, a living at it or don't make a good living at it or you don't have to do it on the side or they struggle to make a living at it. So those of us who went into advertising maybe compromised our principles. We're not going to be the great American novelist by being a copywriter, but you can do both. Some of the best mm -hmm. uh, best-selling authors out there started out as copywriters. That's right. Uh, 
Yeah. And uh, I'm thinking of uh, Wa- uh, Lee, uh, who writes the uh, Jack Reacher novels. And uh, oh, right. yeah. Uh, yeah, he's a copywriter. Of... Stephen Pressfield's another one. Who's yes. A, yeah. mm-hmm. Stephen Pressfield. So there's, you know, it's like, it's like, you know, if, if you want to be happy and you also want to be rich or, you know, however you define rich. And rich to me is rich in friends and relationships and money and life experience you know it's not just you know the big castle at the you know in the rich part of town where nobody comes to see you and you have no friends that's not being rich to right right so you know to 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 do that to 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 figure it out you have to lead a full life and a full life is not just business and it's not just not business either so there's a there's it's it's a complex nuanced mess that that this wonderful life we've been given here full of fear and adventure and wondrous discovery and horror and night sweats and <laughs> you know th- it's the whole package it's everything and once you learn to embrace that and go for it boy the ride gets really fun at that point that's the truth yeah thank you john and i want to mention it's john dash uh if you spent only the next five years on that site you would be <laughs> uh, an amazingly rich marketer uh, your life would be richer and more colorful. Colorful. Uh, John does offer uh, some coaching, primarily through his Platinum Mastermind, which I'm right. honored to be on the uh, faculty of. And man, we just have a blast uh, getting together and digging deep into all the members' businesses and, and laughing our heads off uh, in the evenings. So uh, you might want to look into that if the kind of stuff we're talking about sounds like something you need in your life. john com. Look at the Platinum Mastermind. And uh, John, I, you know, I've said it a hundred times to you. I could say it a million more and, and it would never be enough. But just thank you for everything you've done for me in, in my life and career. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. You've been the best student I've ever had. It's great. To be able to, you know, have someone go out there and put it to put it to use, and those the types like you are few and far between. So, congratulations on all your success, well earned, my man. Thanks, buddy. Appreciate it. And uh, one of my cherished photos now is the one of you and my son sitting on the couch playing guitar together. Because uh, <laughs> for you to become a mentor in his life now, in some regard, is pretty pretty special too. So, and he's shredding now, which he's is shredding. a joy this season. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Thanks, pal. We'll talk soon. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Hey, thanks again for listening to the Truth About Marketing podcast. If you like this show and you think other people would like this show, the best way to spread the word is by reviewing and rating the show in iTunes. Just log in, click review, leave a big old fat five-star review, and let everybody know that you dig the show so that they can dig it too. To get all the links and resources we mentioned on today's episode, please go to copychief.com forward slash TAM, as in truth about marketing. And if you'd like to uh, learn more about how you can improve your sales copy with uh, templates, formulas, coaching, feedback, or hiring a pro, do all that on the inside of the members area of copychief.com and I will look for you there. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.